My name is Norman Allard. I can hear the heartbeat of this world. Water. Without it, we wouldn't survive. Just like the lifeblood that flows through our own veins, it gets pumped around the planet. It travels through the air as vapor, and as it gathers, it forms clouds in the sky. It falls back to the world as rain. Or as snow. In the mountaintops, it waits to melt, triggering the spring runoff, also known as freshet. The journey begins as small tributary streams that resemble the outer branches of a tree. The many small branches begin to combine into larger streams. Eventually, they form small rivers. Some become large enough to span hundreds of kilometers, like the Kootenai River. In the mountains, these rivers flow into the many lakes found in the valley bottoms. But there's one place where water exists, is the key component to a unique habitat. My name's Tom B.B. Kauser. I'm a wildlife biologist and a wetland ecologist. I like visiting wetlands because they're beautiful to look at and they're full of wildlife. Anytime I go out to a wetland, I get surprised by what I see. There can be frogs, toads, salamanders, ducks, geese, Sometimes I'll catch a glimpse of a swan or maybe a sandhill crane. They're just fascinating places to visit. Wetlands have the most unique beauty with all the different colors and textures of vegetation. You'll find plants and wetlands that grow nowhere else on earth. And wetlands are rare, like jewels. What they have in them is something special. And I find great value in wetlands because they're so important to animals and they're young. They're so important to fish and wildlife. And they're so important to me because they clean the water I drink and they recharge the groundwater so that when I use, use a well, I can have some water because I know that it's being uh, put back into the earth by the wetland areas. And I'm finding out that wetlands are really important too because they reduce flooding. So I live in a community that has many flood problems and we're working to bring back the wetlands so that we don't have as much trouble with the flooding. Building a wetland for me is the most important thing I can do in my life. I'm restoring something that will last forever. I worked with other scientists to investigate natural wetlands and I found that these wetlands are 10, 20,000 years old. The wetlands that I'm restoring, I'm patterning them after the natural wetlands, and I think that they're going to be around forever. So many wetlands have been lost to drainage, and if I can do my small part to help bring back some of these important ecosystems, then I think I've made the world a better place. The wetlands are so beautiful and interesting. I, every wetland I've visited has been full of life. To visit a wetland, it's like opening a Christmas present. You're surprised by what you're gonna see. And some wetlands I see mallards, others I'll see wood ducks, some I find northern leopard frogs, still others I find spotted salamanders. And it's just really exciting and rewarding to see what uses these, these wetlands that we've been restoring. They really are a gift that keeps on giving and should be around 
for many, many years, if not forever. What I've never understood is why people would destroy a wetland. I know that there's a great need to grow crops, and I know that people don't like the way wetlands look, but I think wetlands look great. I think the plants, the cattails, the burrweed, the water lilies, they're special, they're unique. So I think they're beautiful areas, should be protected, and where they have been eliminated, should be brought back. And this can be done, and it's not that difficult to do. I'm here in British Columbia, the most beautiful place on earth, working to restore wetlands, the most beautiful ecosystems on earth. This is a tremendous job, going out and looking at all the different wetlands that have been built over the last few years, seeing the flocks of geese, mallards, wood ducks, jumping Columbia spotted frogs. It's just terrific getting out and exploring these wetlands. Today we saw grizzly bear tracks in using a wetland area. They're feeding on the cattails. It's just tremendous what we see living in these wetlands and very rewarding. We can bring back these imperiled ecosystems and we can do it on a landscape scale for not that much money. And that's what's really exciting to see happening out here, is bringing back these traditionally important plants and animals to the community. And it's just really rewarding and I'm thrilled to be a part of it. I know this is a stark contrast to the lush green imagery you've just seen. Truth is, if you use dikes to cut off wetlands from river systems, they require constant maintenance. By August, this is what the hunting grounds looked like if the pumps were not run for months on end to fill them. It's a costly affair, not only to pay for the electricity, there's ditching put in place you need to keep clear. Infrastructure needs to be repaired and eventually replaced. There's also dikes that need upkeep so water stays in place according to designed plans. Without constant maintenance and a connection to the river, these areas will dry up. I don't quite understand the need to have full control over nature. I can relate to needing consistency but wetlands depend on a natural ebb and flow. Their beauty lies in providing their surroundings with exactly what it needs. Keeping wetlands consistent from year to year benefits a small fraction of their capabilities, and populations dependent on the life cycle change inevitably decline. From year to year, they're meant to rise and fall in a complementary fashion according to the land's carrying capacity for its inhabitants. So what can we do to help? The answer is simple, we do what we can. The design work's been done for us. Nature's already created what we're trying to achieve. As indigenous people, we've lived with and studied these systems for eons. Including our knowledge is extremely beneficial and long overdue. By using restoration work, we can begin to help renaturalize habitats, no matter the project size. So we began restoring the wetlands on the inside of these impoundments. Then we removed the dams that separated the floodplain from the nearby rivers and streams. And as nature waited to be let back in, we opened up a historic connection, allowing for an exchange of nutrients that rivers and wetlands desperately needed. Water's incompressible. Having floodplains gives it room to breathe and mitigates flood risk. Well-hydrated soils keep vegetation lush and green, making the land more fire-resistant. Carbon is captured through the growth of plants, animals, and invertebrates. And most importantly, stability is added to a climate beginning to fluctuate wildly. 
Going back to the spring of 2021, the newly reconnected wetlands experienced a flood event that hasn't happened in close to 40 years. Fresh water entered the system where only rain, snow, and seepage had kept the wetlands on life support for decades. That year, we experienced extreme drought and heat. Temperatures reached as high as 46 degrees Celsius in an area where high 30s were once considered record-breaking. But the wetlands still held water. These numerous wetlands, both small and large, would have disappeared in this extremely hot year. In 2022, a cold, long spring brought a high freshet. Because of the wetland's ability to absorb large amounts of water, it soaked up the freshet and slowly released that water, stemming impacts that would have been felt both up and downstream. Again, high summer temps and lack of rain for months affected the valley. But the restored floodplain held even more water after being rehydrated for the second year in a row. The early successes of this restoration are astounding. Many who are waiting to get back in have returned and they brought friends. What more can I say? There are plenty of intricacies to cover, too many to reveal in a short film. But if you have to know something, take a close look at this clip. Tell me, how many western painted turtles do you see? I counted about 116. Was I close? And now you're busy counting instead of watching. <laughs> So let's recap. We went from adding water in the spring to keeping that water through the heat and into the fall. And as winter sets in, those who migrate are on their way south. And those who hibernate have found their winter beds. The vapor from evaporated water heads to the sky and returns as snow. And the water that stayed ices over. All of it waiting until next spring to cycle around again. A quick summary for me. I'm very grateful to Laura Kootenay Ban for undertaking these massive projects that are extremely important to this world. And I'm lucky to have met people like Tom Bibikauser who ignite passion about their work wherever they go. And to the many talented people who work on this project who've become my friends. <laughs> because I need somebody to call when I get in trouble. This project wouldn't have happened without all of you. I just want to say thank you for your help. My name is Norman Allard. I've been able to learn from a number of different sources, children, environmental specialists, those who hold indigenous knowledge, and even nature itself. 
They've all taught me to listen to the heartbeat of this world. I know many of you hear it. And if you don't, I hope you do soon. Good? Or do you want to say more? They have covered it. Let me tell you about Norman Allard Jr., the most dedicated, organized, and effective natural resource manager I have met, who has taken the lead in restoring wetlands here in British Columbia in the Creston area. And I want to say thank you. It'll probably get cut. But. All right. <laughs>